much as this is the diabolical <laughs> mind tricks of Satan himself to sort of stage whispering in the David's ears. God's not going to rescue you this time. Verse 8. Verse 8. That's a dark scenario. Verses 1 and 2. Pause. Salah. Let it sink in. Verse 3. But you are a shield around me, O Yahweh. You bestow glory on me. And lift up my head. To the Lord I cried aloud. To Yahweh I cry aloud. And he answers me from his holy hill. Be impressed with the fact that verses 3 and 4 are nothing like verses 1 and 2, right? The tune, the tempo, the mood of the song changes with the change of the mood of the lyrics. This is what the enemies are saying. This is what David reminds himself of. And he goes back and he draws from the verbiage that God himself had declared to Abraham. And don't let it miss your understanding that Abram won the battle, and right now it looks like David is losing the battle. And David is saying with confidence, he is reminding himself, but you, but you are a shield about me. You are a shield that surrounds me. Now I find that really interesting. Because as we've already noted, and as we, as great uh, scholars of uh, ancient warfare, have determined uh, that a shield can only protect so much. And your goal as a good soldier was just to keep the shield between you and the enemy. It's almost like in this moment, David becomes part of you. It's almost like David becomes a science fiction writer. What David is describing and what the Lord is providing for him, the imagery is almost like a force field. It's around him on all sides. But you, O oh Yahweh, are a shield about me. You're a shield that surrounds me. What an incredible reminder, because at this moment, David doesn't know who his enemies are. He doesn't know who he can trust. He doesn't know who's got his back. Yahweh's got his back. Jehovah has his back. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about him. There are three definitive things that David says about God. That's the first. I want you to note the second. And you are my glory. You are my glory. Think about the glory of a king. You remember that Jesus... In his earthly ministry, he stopped and as he taught and as he gave us perspective, he talked about the lilies of the field, how they grow, and he said, in reference to King Solomon, that King Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as these lilies that are here today in God's all right, so think for a moment. What is the glory of a king? What was Solomon's glory? Oh, man. He had splendor galore, right? We talked yesterday. How much, do you remember? How much gold was he bringing in every single year? Anyone remember? 25,000 tons of gold every year. 
25,000 tons of gold. This year and the next year, 25,000 tons of gold again. Market value, today's economy, gold prices, 25,000 tons of gold, $1.2 billion. And then the description goes on of how Solomon built and decorated his palace, his throne room, his robes. And then the Queen of Sheba comes and says, the half of it hasn't been told. Solomon's glory. The glory of a king. The glory of Queen Elizabeth. Are the crown. The robes, the jewels, the splendor of the palace. David, at this moment, has none of that. He is running. He is fleeing. He is barefoot. He turns to his wives. He turns to his concubines and says, go back. They'll be merciful to you. It'll be worse if you are with me. I am a man on the run. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me. And you are my glory. David's got no crowns. He's got no robes. No gold. Nothing with him. I think in part what David is doing is he's latching on to, he's hanging on to that promise that God made him back in 1 Samuel chapter 7. That he was the king. And that his descendants, <coughs> from his descendants, would come one who would sit on the throne of David. The promised Messiah. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, and you are my glory. And then the third declaration that David makes. You are the lifter of my head. I think that one's my favorite. There's not a parent here that hasn't had that moment with your child when for whatever reason their shoulders are forward and their head is down. And as a parent, you got right down by them and you either put your hand under their chin or you put both hands on either side of their face and what did you do? You turned their face up. And you talked to them. You get that? That's what David is saying right here. You are a shield about me. Speaks in military type language, right? You are my glory. Speaks to David's experience as a king and, and, and speaks in terms of, of the promises that God had made of dynasty and of covenant. But when David says, you are the lifter of my head, he's looking to God as a parent, as a father. And then, in verse 4, he says, To Yahweh I cry aloud. I am crying to Him as the Almighty General. I am crying to Him as the God who makes promises and delivers on those promises. I am crying to Him like I would a little child to a parent. And He answers me from His holy hill. Is David referring to heaven on high? 
quite possibly. Or is David referring back to Jerusalem where all the mess is going on right now? But that's where God's tabernacle still is. Out of the very heart of the mess, God answered Salah. Pause. Now we're going to have yet another change, and very quickly. Look at the rest of the psalm. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because Yahweh sustains me. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. Arise, O Lord. Deliver me, O my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From Yahweh comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. Salah. So in the first two verses, it is as dark, it is as bleak as it can be. In verses 3 and 4, we see David's resolve. This is going to be my perspective. This is going to be where I anchor my heart. I am calling on the Lord. This is what the Lord has promised. This is what the Lord is going to do. He is going to be my shield. He is going to be my glory. He is going to lift up my head. I am crying out to Him. Case closed. Done. Psalm should end right there. Problem? Resolution. Problem? Answer. So what's the story with verses 5? Through eight. Five through eight is the practical living out of living in the confidence that is expressed in verses three and four. And the real problem that's still there of enemies talked about back in verses one and two. What verses 5 through 8 do for us is they make it very, very practical. You see, this isn't just theoretical. This isn't just spiritual. And we put it over here in this cubbyhole, and then we get back to work, and we get back to real life, quote unquote. This shows us how the spiritual impacts daily life. And so David, based on the fact that he knows that the Lord is his shield, his glory, the lifter of his head, tells us how he's going to go about life. So, in verse 5, I'm going to lay down. I'm going to sleep. It's not going to keep me up at night. I wake again. Why? Because the Lord is the one who's going to sustain me. He is the one who gives me strength. Like that old saying, why should I stay up all night worrying about it? I'm going to get some sleep. The Lord, He's going to be up all night anyway. Let Him in. David's perspective is, even though I'm still surrounded by enemies, I can have a sweet rest because I know God is in control. He says, I'm not going to fear tens of thousands that are drawn up against me on every side. Get the point of what he's saying. If there are 5,000 this way and 5,000 behind me, I don't have to worry. Because my God, he is a shield all around. If there's a couple of thousand over here that I forgot to count the first time, and a whole bunch of folks over on this side, God is my shield all around me. Now, context here is literal military. But we know and we understand that this is speaking about spiritual warfare for us. And Satan loves nothing more than to try to do a sneak attack, to do a roundabout and ambush us when we're least prepared. But thou, Lord, art a shield around me. 
And even though there may be tens of thousands that are drawn up against me on every side, I will not fear. Verse 7 tells us more of David's prayer. Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God. I want you to act, Lord. Do it, do it now. Please. I know you promised. I'm here waiting. Now, it's easy to kind of look at that and sit back and be somewhat critical and say, well, David really should be more patient. Why is he in such a hurry? He just needs to have a calmness, a peace about this. The Lord's going to take care of it. Hey, he's already declared the peace. I can sleep at night. When David is saying, arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God, this doesn't come out of angst. This is a declaration of faith that I am not going to try to fight the battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. Arise, O Lord. Deliver me. Oh my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Uh, the word here, the imagery here, is exactly what Jesus refers to when he says if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. The idea of break the teeth of the wicked. Wow, that's a little harsh. Hey, remember, these guys are trying to kill him. The imagery is what ancient cultures would do when they would capture a lion or a tiger and they would bring it to the king. It was a symbol of victory. And they would break the teeth, the big canines of those big cats. It was rendered subdued and given to the king. Break the teeth of the wicked. Verse 8, from Yahweh comes deliverance. May your blessing be on the people. The Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart, right? I want you to look at his perspective right here at the end. The whole nation has turned against him. His own son is leading the coup. We've already identified the fact that he doesn't know who and how many his enemies are. He's fleeing barefoot. You want to know the heart of David? It's right there. He's praying for the people. He has a shepherd's heart. He's praying for his flock. And then, don't let it escape your notice that right at the end of the psalm, the psalm is done. Why put another salah right at the end of the psalm? It's done. <coughs> Well, in part, I think what David is saying, or what the Spirit working through David is communicating is, hey, don't be so quick to jump on over to, and start reading Psalm 4. Let this sink in. Scholars think that the Salah at the very end of the psalm also served another function. There are a lot of folks here that <coughs> grew up in the same uh, era me, listening to music from, pop music from the 60s, 70s, 80s, change starting about the beginning of the 90s. All right, help me out here. Every single song that was played on the radio in the 60s, the 70s, 80s, every pop song that played, how did it end? It faded. It faded, yeah. It was the same, that final line, over and over and over, and it just faded out. <clears throat> that may be the idea of the Salah right here. So apply that. What's the last line? May your blessing be on the people. May your blessing be on the people. May your blessing be on the people. Thanks. Thanks.
thanks for your good attention. Thou, Lord, our shield God.